So Ashton, we had quite the week too. Lots of football craziness happened. And I'll just start it off by asking you one simple question. Will Notre Dame ever win a football game again? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know if you're, if, if we need to quite jump off the cliff just yet. <laughs> um, you were high on, on Notre Dame this year, as was I, I think we, we, we both like Notre Dame a lot and woof, buddy, that looked rough. It, the, the offense was, it, there was no real vertical threat. There was, he had some, some open throws even late in the game when it was still a, um, a, a close game. He had a chance to hit a guy over the top and, and just didn't lead him appropriately. Stuff like that happened a lot. It, it looked yeah. dysfunctional. Yeah. I, 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 I hate to, yeah, it's, it's, it's all, I mean, it's overreaction. I mean, that's, of course, that's what we're going to do here that we're college football fans. We have to, but um, yeah, it looked rough. It looked rough. How your your opinion? How how upset were you watching that game? Did it surprise you at all that you would just come out and just lay an egg like that? Yeah, it was it was so weird because I've seen Notre Dame be upset before. It's been a while. Um, they before this they had won forty two straight games against unranked opponents, mm-hmm. going back to twenty sixteen. Right. Um. And I've seen them lose in heartbreaking fashion before. But I don't know that I've ever seen them play a group of five team and just be outplayed like this. The way right. in a year when they're supposed to be good, you know, 2007 when they lost everybody went three and nine. That's that's a different story. We're talking about 15 years ago, but in the last decade, no, and it didn't it didn't look like a fluke. I mean, they got beat on both sides of the ball, which a week ago, you know, we thought that Notre Dame might have a chance to win that battle with Ohio State on the line of scrimmage, and they did not, which was mildly surprising. And then you go and lose the battle on the line of scrimmage to Marshall. And for, by the way, for anybody, for anybody who's living under a rock and doesn't know, Marshall beat Notre Dame 26 to 21. That's the final score. Yeah. Um, And it did not look like a fluke. They had good cornerback play. They had an incredible line play on both sides, really. It was Notre Dame would hike the ball and immediately their offensive line was about a yard behind where they started, mostly the center and the right card, which we can talk about. (laughs) There's, it's, it's a little bit shocking how just poorly they played everywhere. The quarterback play was bad. You mentioned, you mentioned a little bit, Tyler Buckner went down with with an injury in the fourth quarter. um, But up to that point, he was missing throws. He, He looked okay in some of the intermediate stuff, but had a bunch of deep shots, which is what Marshall was giving them. Marshall was going to force them to beat them deep. Right. And I, I think he completed like one of seven passes that were past 15 or 20 yards, something like that. It was just – and that included – they had Braden Lindsay absolutely wide open at the end of the first half when they could have taken the lead and just sort of sort of going into halftime with like, okay, they gave us their best shot. We're finally in front now, and, and it's it's our turn. And just missed him. Just flat out missed the throw. He had no one close to him. It would have been a touchdown. And you could just feel the, I don't know, it it was just a very deflating situation. Um, The receivers weren't playing well. They quit on a lot of routes. Weren't fighting for the ball. The offensive line, I already mentioned that. The interior offensive line in particular was terrible. Um, The defense was okay. Like, they weren't amazing, but they also played well enough to win against Marshall. Um, they, they they did, but I mean, they gave up a lot of rushing yards too. They did. Like, like most of Marshall's success wasn't really through the air. I think they Marshall ran the ball. Yeah, they ran for 220 yards and a touchdown yes. on on 50 carries. N- not a super high average, but I mean, when when a running back goes for 170 yards, like they're like like Lamb, uh, is it Laborn? Laborn, yeah, former five Laybourne. star for Florida State. No kidding. I did yes. not know that. Mm-hmm. The when when they go for that much, it's yeah, it's a signal that there's they're they're definitely <laughs> they're as I don't you you hate to you hate to say that that um I mean it's two weeks in a row for Notre Dame getting run on, yep. especially late in games. When it matters, yeah. When it matters. It was very yeah, it was it was difficult to watch. And the I, I think what was so so surprising and we sh- yeah, the Sun Belt in general had a terrific, terrific day. Like yes. we get more on more on the rest of those games in a bit. But there's a lot of depth 
in in the Sun Belt. And in some some of these, like we, what we view as lesser conferences, like like they're very much viewed as as not as much. But line play and like they have like a good a good running back or a, a good quarterback mm-hmm. in some instances. They can really give teams um, a a really tough game. It was it was a, they're very physical, hard nosed. We didn't see this. Me me and you, neither one of us saw this one coming because we both had Notre Dame <laughs> in in our locks of the week. We had agreement. <laughs> And when me and you, by the way, I'm not just saying that, but whenever me and you agree on a lock of the week, our our average is insanely high. Like it's incredibly high when me and you agree. And we did. We thought Notre Dame would come out and roll over them. And we talked in our preview that the the only way Notre Dame doesn't come out and just shell Marshall is if there's some residue or or some something left over from last week. Like, yeah. like they're kind of just like just, it, it rolls over from one week to the next. And it seems like it absolutely happened. Like yeah. Notre Dame is no no doubt the more talented football team. No one's debating that. But you got into a, a situation with a scrappy Sun Belt team who has some talent at some key positions. You yeah. mentioned their cornerbacks. The the corners were really good. Stefan Gilmore's, Gilmore's brother, brother. Had, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He had a pick six there to oh. to ice the game pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and like the running back that we talked about too. So it was um yeah, that that has to be like that's. I remember when like like back when that was happening to Georgia a lot, and it was so like as the game rolls on, you get a bad feeling, and then it gets into the third quarter and it's still close, and you're like like you just have a bad feeling, like the body language just isn't in a good place for your team at all, like it starts mm-hmm. to fall apart, and yeah, we saw them not be able to hit shots over the top. It was a, a brilliant plan from Marshall, I think, like as yes. far as going for the upset, like that. Their, their coaches, I mean, hats off to them. That's absolutely. Charles Huff is a really good coach. He, he had them ready to play, and they they were prepared. Clint Trickett is their offensive coordinator. I don't know if you remember the West Virginia quarterback from several yeah. years ago. And yeah, yeah. They, they just played well. So credit goes to Marshall. Like, they are a good team, and they played well. Um, but it's still. <laughs> there's, it's Marshall. It's, it's Marshall. Marshall. You can't yeah. lose that game. And. Yeah, so Buckner goes down in the fourth quarter. Drew Pine comes in, and there was there was a lot of cheering in the stadium. And then on his oh, second really? throw, he threw just a horrible interception. Like it was yeah. so bad. Yeah. And to add in, to add injury to insult, um, yeah, we find out today that Buckner is out most likely for the entire season. Yeah. Um, so it'll be Drew Pine and possibly some true freshman Steve Angeli going forward. And it's a little scary. I'm just saying like, and I think Tommy Reese definitely shares some blame because the play calling was not perfect by any stretch. There was some questionable play calling that I didn't like that being said, there was just a lot of missed execution. Like it, it was rough. So maybe the biggest thing for the coaches is not play calling. It's just going back to the basics and like focusing on doing the little things right, because that Notre Dame was not doing the little things right. And I think something I mentioned or. I think we mentioned it maybe in our preview of Notre Dame before they even started the year, like our, our, our season preview for Notre Dame was that, that they didn't really have any terrific receivers. We, we knew that, but they had an elite tight end and we thought they had some good, good pieces at running back. Some, at least some, some, yeah. Yeah. Like, like some, some matchup problems for people. And mm-hmm. Tyree is, was one of them, all, another former five-star and he got five touches in this game. He got yeah. three carries and, and, and two um, receptions. Like it feels a week like after like, not having enough to, touches against Ohio State. Well, we complained about it last week, right? We complained about the exact exact same thing last week. We're like, we need to be getting this guy the ball more. And and against Marshall, like it really felt like he could have been used a lot. Even if even if you option him out of the backfield, like a lot of like like simple running back, like shallow routes, some stuff, get a quick guy in space and let him make a man miss. Yeah, see mm-hmm. what happens. So yeah, n- none of it happened. Buckner, he did look rattled. Um, and I actually felt really sorry for him after that pick six. You could see like how like he was really mad. He was just, yeah, disgusted with himself. And he you I felt sorry for him. Like I'm not a Notre Dame sure. fan. I'm not a Marshall fan. I didn't it didn't hurt me any, but I felt sorry for Buckner. And then he gets hurt um what just a couple of plays later. And yeah, looks like he will be out for the year, and that hurts. But mm-hmm. is okay. So Marcus Freeman, let's just step back for a bit and we'll just scope back a little bit to like overall as, as a whole, as a program, Marcus Freeman, you're three games in now, 
because he did coach the bowl game. Mm-hmm. He's 0-3, 0-2 this year. I mean, we, we can count only his, this is his first two true games um, sure. as the leader, but it has not looked good. It, right. It's been it's been a struggle. What are what do you think? What what's the what's the um, instant reaction here? Uh, I I think it's so if we're looking at it from a big picture standpoint, like it's way too early to make any kind of judgments on Marcus Freeman. Sure. I I do think that one of the things we will learn about him is the way he the way he moves forward from this because we've seen. As a Notre Dame fan growing up my whole life, every Notre Dame coach has always had some big things that they've had to deal with and come through. Brian Kelly was, he almost missed a bowl game his first season. And they, they had just a bunch of, there were people literally calling for Brian Kelly to be fired in year one. A lot of that was due to some off the field stuff. But it's, it's how you react. It's how you kind of bounce back from that. And then Brian Kelly's second year, um, I think an SP plus, like they were the number 10 team in the country or something like really good. And they went like eight and five. They, they, yeah. they lost to USF that year in one of the more unlike like that, that if this felt like it was the first, I felt the same way after this upset in a way that I hadn't felt since USF 2011, 11 years <laughs> ago, it was that level of bad. And, but Brian Kelly, then his third year, they find, they, strung some wins together, started winning the games they were supposed to. They made it to the national championship game. They weren't the number two team in the country, but they were clearly figured something out. And yeah. so my way, what I'm saying here is Marcus Freeman is not going to be judged, I don't believe, on he lost to Marshall. We're going to, five years from now, look back and say, how did Marcus Freeman react to losing to that? Did it, did it all go downhill from there and things just fell apart and he never – figured it out or did he learn from it and start figuring things out uh, we, we've been saying it <laughs> so most people that are, that are smart have not been saying okay this is a year for Notre Dame to win the national title we've been saying Marcus Freeman was hired to raise the talent sure. level on the team right. this was never going to be the year now it was supposed to be better than this that's for dang sure like this is a problem <laughs> um, the first his first year will almost certainly be viewed as a failure compared to preseason expectations. It will be yes. because they were ranked number five and there's almost no way you reach that again. Even if you went out, you might not be number five. Agreed. But how how does he bounce back from that? How does he lead these young men? I'm I'm talking we're talking a lot about Notre Dame. I'm I'm sorry. Like I, I just I want to see the reaction. I want to see them come out and play hard the rest of the year. And I want to see if if we go through the year and we see, okay, some things need to change. The offensive line coach, maybe he was not a good hire or whatever. Like everyone thought he was, Harry he stand coming back. Maybe Tommy Reese needs to be nudged to a quarterback coaching job in the NFL or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, and that's another facet of, of this. Like we always hear how smart Tommy Reese is, and I think he is. But there's something to be said for in college. Like sometimes simple is okay. Like – let your college players execute simple offense, and sometimes that's the way to go. And I think maybe sometimes it's a li- they ask a little too much from them. I don't know. So, yeah, I, there's a lot to that. I think it's yeah, you have to be really careful as a as a as like I, there's a okay, there's a lot of coaches that are viewed as super smart dudes, mm-hmm. and oftentimes they end up on the ESPN analyst desk. Because yeah. like they got fired because they they were too smart for their players like it didn't work it, it yeah. has to work like it's a it's a very much a results business and when you put up thirty one points in your first two games of the season that's not a great start like yeah. that's that's really not a great start for your offense so yeah g- gonna need more than that and we will just point out Notre Dame's schedule the rest of the way not a cakewalk right. not a cakewalk they play they play three teams that are still or, well that are currently in the AP top 12. Um, so BYU Clemson and USC um, are both mm-hmm. off to flyers to start this year. And, and you have to play all three of those games. And, and that's not, those aren't the only hard ones too. North Carolina, Syracuse looks kind of good right now. Like, yep. yeah, there's some tricky games out there still. And, but in some ways that's almost like, that's good and bad. Like you could, you could lose those games, but say you pick off one of those teams, say you pick off Clemson or USC mm-hmm. and, and suddenly that happens at the end of the year, you're feeling much, much better as you're, yeah, as you're heading into your offseason, feel like you're on the upswing again. Um, 
but yeah, like it, it, it very much could go the, the other way too, where you, you get yeah. bombed by a couple of these teams and you're not feeling good at all. So I think, I yeah, think it's still out there. No, I, I agree. No, I, I'm like, I'm, I just want to say that I, I agree like with you completely. It's still, it's still out there. It's not, it's not career defining for Marcus Freeman. It's not program defining yet for Notre Dame, but it could be this year could be defining for him. If some of this continues, if they don't show improvement next week against Cal or the week, the week after that against North Carolina, like it, it has to improve. Yeah. So I, I do think that just looking forward a little bit in this season specifically, it, anybody that can score an offense is going to give Notre Dame trouble um, because I do think Notre Dame's defense is good enough to hold anybody under 30. But if you have a really good offense in college football, you're going to score in the twenties and I'm not positive Notre Dame can do that right now. They're averaging 15 and a half points per game. So I don't know when my team became Northwestern, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, speaking of teams with just really underperforming offenses, this will be a theme. Um, so another question I texted you today was, is the South, is the uh, Sun Belt the best conference in the country? Obviously, tongue in cheek mm. on that question, but we another huge upset. Notre Dame was not even the highest ranked team this week to lose to a Sun Belt team. Um, that honor wow. d- belongs to Texas A&M, who lost to uh, the App State team that just lost narrowly to, to North Carolina. And, right. I mean, it's a little bit the same story for A&M. Just the offense absolutely couldn't do a thing. They scored 14 points, and half of that was a kick return. Yeah. Think about that. Against a Sun Belt team. Yeah. So, wh- where do they I'm, go the- from here? The time of possession in this game. Do, did you have you seen the time of possession? I don't totals believe I in saw this that. game. App State had the ball for 41 and a half minutes. Ooh. Texas AM had the ball for a little bit over 18. That, like, it's all you really need to know. You got physically pushed around by, yeah, another, another Sun Belt team. Yet another Sun Belt team. But this is what App State does. Like, App State, it shouldn't have surprised us too much. Yeah. Um, the, the App State side of it. But AM lost this game because the offense was completely inept. They had nine total first downs. Nine. Yeah. They didn't even have 200 yards total of offense. Yeah. Yeah. 97 yards passing. All the stats are bad. Like there, there are no good stats to to turn to if you're AM. Haynes King is not the guy. No. Like th- this here, okay. AM has way bigger problems than Notre Dame does. Notre Dame's uh, it's a first year head coach at Notre Dame. It's he's just getting his thing going. He's just bringing players in young quarterback in there. No experience. Jimbo's been there for a while now. Jimbo's recruited well for a while now. This offense has been trash for a while now. Yeah. <laughs> like that. I mean, other than just handing the ball to a chain and, and hoping that, you know, he pops one loose. They didn't have anything like yeah. there was, they had no answers. I, I, yeah, this one here is much, much more concerning. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know where they go with with this one here. I mean, yeah, Jimbo hasn't had a good offense since really since James Winston went to the NFL. And mm-hmm. we I, I think we've said that a number of times. Haynes King's tremendously talented. He is not the like he's not going to do what Jameis did for you in that offense. Max Johnson, how Max Johnson didn't get the to see the field here is beyond me. I like Max Johnson. Well, you did too. Like we yeah. both were kind of Max Johnson guys a little bit. Um, he's he has some experience winning big games. He he beat Florida um, there in the swamp in 2020 when they were really good in the the, the shoe throw game. He he led a led a drive to win a game. Like he has some experience there. Yeah, how, how that? I mean, something must be really off there at a And M for for you not to make a change. Can, seeing what you saw, I. That's that's kind of all I really have, like on this game. I don't have much else. It was really, really bad. Even worse than like your your first thought is like, well, App State's kind of good. I mean, I could see how they would catch you on an on on yeah. you know an off week, but like you got physically pushed around. I yeah, I don't understand that. How they have like three times as much ball control as you do in time of possession. I'll I'll never understand that. Yeah, is there? What what's the upside for AM this year? Like, is there any way to fix this? Or do, is it are you just waiting for December so you can hire a new offensive coordinator? Because 
I like I don't know like because I don't think the personnel is really the issue. So it, no, it yeah, seems so like it should be able to be fixed, right? But how do how do you even go about doing that? Yeah, if you're Jimbo and you're the play caller, <laughs> well, how did you not fix this over the off season though? You know what I mean? Like like this was this is the same problems that they had last year. Like let's not act like this wasn't an eight and four team last year with a ton of talent. That like you see when it all when it all clicks and when it all works. They can beat they can beat anybody. They beat Alabama last year. Like yeah. they can they can play with anyone. The problem is like it's so seldom all works. It's so seldom clicks. Yeah, I th- we talk about schedules kind of like with Notre Dame. Like where does this look at for the rest of the year? Mm-hmm. And for okay, so A and M now has to play Miami this week, number thirteen team in the nation. Then it's number ten Arkansas week after that. Then Mississippi State. Then at Alabama. That's I mean, yeah, Saban's going to be out for blood. Um, in revenge for that one, Ole Miss is now ranked 20th. Florida's ranked 18th. You play a lot of really, really good football teams from here. Like we're just getting started, boy. <laughs> like <laughs> this could be really interesting. A bunch of teams that find out too that hey, we're gonna sit down on you. We're gonna take away the running game. Beat us. Beat us over the top. Have your quarter. Your quarterback's gonna have to throw for 300 yards to beat it. To 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 beat some of these teams. I don't know if I don't know if AM can do it. I I hate to sound yeah, just so drastic about it, but it was it's tough to see positives after a game like that. I hear you. Yeah. It, it, I don't I think this might have to be a situation where the AD steps in in the off season and says, "Hey Jimbo, we're paying you a ton of money. We need you to just be the head coach right. and uh hire an actual offense coordinator to call the plays." Right. Uh, short you, of that, I don't know what you could do. You have people like Joe Brady out there, you know, like yeah. I think Joe Brady, Joe Brady just got fired last off season and he is now like a quarterback's coach in the NFL. That guy would gladly come back to college if you would just give him the keys to an offense and like, yeah. imagine what, what that would do. Yeah. I mean, or, or look at what he did with 2019 LSU and like, imagine what he could do with, with this, with this batch of receivers. Cause they have good receivers. They have weapons like mm-hmm. Evan Stewart's a really good player. Um, Nia Smith. We, we talk about H. Anaya Smith, A chain mm-hmm. still there. Like they have some really like some matchup nightmares, and yeah, just not in good situations right now. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the huge noon game, Alabama twenty, Texas nineteen. We both had Alabama in our locks for the week. Um, Texas came and fought, man. I don't know what happened there, but Alabama looked kind of lost on offense, I thought, and Quinn Ewers was balling out until he got hurt towards the end of the first quarter. Hudson Card came in and was limping around on one leg. Um, and this came down to an Alabama field goal at the end. What what did you think about this game? Because it was weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I one thing I do it's funny. Okay, this is funny. When Alabama goes and plays a Big 12 team, and then the Big 12 team's like mad. Cause like they're getting all the calls and they talk about it on Fox. They're getting all the calls. Alabama's getting all the calls. Like we're just Georgia fans sitting over here. Like no kidding. Like where have you been the last 15 years? Of course they get all the calls. No, you, yeah. I don't really want to hear it either from like Alabama fans. Like we talked, we heard a lot about injuries and like if they hadn't been injured in the title game last year, that Alabama was, was actually the better team and should have won the game had the receivers not went down. Texas would have absolutely won this game had Quinn Ewers not get gotten hurt there in the first quarter. He was playing really, really well. He was. Um, yeah, it was that was that's tough to watch. I, I don't know. Has there been any information on how long it looked like his his injury was, I mean, borderline season ending. I don't know if that's true or not. I have the one heard. thing I saw said two to three weeks. The other thing I saw said four to six weeks. So okay, not not the big. whole year, but for a little while yet. Right. So they like Texas had some weapons. I want to say um, like Xavier Worthy is a, a is a matchup. He's a matchup problem for anybody in the nation. Mm-hmm. Like anybody in the nation, that guy was getting open on the regular. Yeah. And to Texas is their 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 DBs like they. Like their whole defense, really, their whole defense was exceptional. They gave up the one Mm -hmm. long run to McClellan there early. That was pretty much it until Bryce Young just decided to put the team on his back and kind of 
Jason Bourne his way to a to a win, which like he can do because it was basically Auburn last year. I mean, yeah, no, it's kind of the same. Bryce Young just said, "I got this, guys. No one else can do it. I'll do it myself." (laughs) That's pretty much what he did. Like that's really impressive. But I overall, Texas, there are no moral victories. But if there were moral victories, this should be one for Texas. Yeah. Um, you don't get points for playing Alabama close. Just ask Florida from last year. Uh, Dan Mullen, also not coaching football, also on an analyst desk now. But, yeah, you don't get points for playing Alabama close. But Texas but should have won recruits. this <laughs> you, well, you might. Yeah. Arch Manning. Like, imagine the Arch Manning sweepstakes a little bit. Hmm. Arch just commits to Texas. If Alabama comes to town and just throttles you by five touchdowns, like, I'm not saying Arch would decommit. I'm not saying any of that. But some of maybe some of the guys that Arch is trying to bring along with him might. Yeah. So, yeah. it. But now Texas is, like, I hate to say Texas is back. We're not going to say Texas is back. <laughs> it's been said way too much. But they could be back. Like, there's a chance Texas is actually back. There so, is a yeah. You're impressed, really, with Texas overall, especially the defense. Um sucks for Quinn Ewers I think I mean everyone kind of says the same thing about that like it really sucks for Quinn Ewers it it does that they would have won that game with him in there Um, I have no questions about that so yeah I I don't know Alabama's receivers do we want to talk about Alabama's lack of receivers because it's it's crazy they they Ja'Cory Brooks is the one guy that made some plays finally in the fourth quarter when they started throwing to him where it seemed like he was open most of the time in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. But so much of the game, they, they weren't getting open. And I wonder how much of that is the receivers. Or here's another question I have for you. Does Bill O'Brien just really suck as a coach? Uh, that's <laughs> been floated out there as well. I, I, I've heard that that going around a lot, that Bill O'Brien really is not that good. Jameer Gibbs is by far their next best weapon behind oh, Bryce yeah. on offense. Like, not even close. He's probably their best receiver. Like, if yeah. you line him up – well, he was their leading receiver in this game. Um, At one Trey point, Holt, he had seven catches, and none of the receivers had more than one. Yeah, yeah. Jermaine Burton, uh, their transfer in from Georgia, I think he had two for ten yards. I, that's not funny. I'm not laughing. You won't <laughs> catch me laughing at that, but whatever. No, no big deal. It sucks for him. Treshawn Holden had a decent game, I think, but mm-hmm. there there is no there is no Mechie and Jamison Williams on that roster right now, or at least no one that's that's there currently. So, yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. I I think really what kind of what I thought of when as this game was going on that this is actually kind of who Alabama was last year. A little bit. But we forgot it. We we forgot about it because they came and they had the really good game against Georgia in the SEC championship and scored a lot of points against a historic defense. Mm-hmm. But we don't we forget about the Iron Bowl from last year where they really sucked on offense. We forget about the LSU game that they could have lost, the Florida game that they could have lost. There there was there was a number of games in there that are that are one score games late that they yeah they absolutely could have lost and the offense looked out of rhythm last year even. And Bryce Young, he's yeah, he's the ultimate just wallpaper guy. He can just he can just wallpaper over all the holes in your offense. But th- it kind of showed a little bit until the end when 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 Young got it together and and yeah decided I'm just gonna win. But mm-hmm. they have they have they have issues. They are they were viewed as the unquestioned number one coming into this year. Um, and yeah, I would say that they're definitely not the most complete team right now. Will Anderson looked out of his element. In the first half, he had four penalties, I believe. I think three offsides and one just ridiculous personal foul after the play was over. It, it was like, mm-hmm. I, I, this is the guy that we've all been saying is the best player in the country. And it looked like the moment was like too big for him or something, which I'm not saying that's what happened. It just, he was not, it, it was like he was mentally not there. <laughs> and then, I, I don't know if you saw after the game, um, so I think uh, he, while he was running out to shake hands, Saban, I I Saban did. saw one of his players doing the horns down, and, and he said, you know, don't yeah. do that S word. And yeah, and then yeah. after the game, like when they were walking out of the out of the stadium, you had Bama players flashing horns down to the Texas fans. It's like, guys, you were supposed to win this game by three touchdowns. Yeah, you you won by one. You got lucky because Quinn Ewers got hurt, and now you're flashing horns down like. Have a little like, what? What's the word? Like, 
self-awareness. <laughs> like, yeah. guys, you, you, you're you not automatically just going to be the best team. Like, you're not automatically going to win the title this year. You actually <laughs> – the. I don't know. I think maybe there's maybe a little bit of that rat poison that Saban likes to talk about, where maybe they've rat been reading poison. their. Yeah, I don't know. I, it, it, I do think that Alabama in three months will be a lot better than they are now. I'm just surprised that they're not better now than they showed on Saturday. Yeah, we we had anointed them as the title favorite in the off season, and that's not just us. I feel like. Almost everyone did. Yeah. And and why why wouldn't you? You have the best two players in all of college football coming back with the greatest coach of all time. Like, yeah, wh- why wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. But they have issues. Like there is large concerns, and most of it, most of it's on the offense. Like Will, Will Anderson, he he did look a little out of his element, but in the fourth quarter, like where was he? He was he was sacking quarterback. Sure. Um, just just like like what we thought he would. So in yeah. Mm-hmm little maybe a little rattle in the first half definitely not at all um later on in the game they only gave up 19 points their defense is fine not really concerned about the defense the offense and the lack of receivers is a real problem going forward um yeah just seeing how how that all pans out will be interesting alabama another team who has a lot of difficult games still coming up yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of uh there's a lot of other texases if you will on alabama's schedule Mm-hmm. Um, but hey, in the end, they're two and zero, and the numbers that really matter, they are two and zero, and yeah, it, on a collision course with Georgia um, in that SEC championship again. Sure, let's talk about the Kentucky Florida game just a little bit. So this was kind of hyped as the big game, biggest game of the week, in, in, by by a lot of people's opinion. Um, Kentucky goes to the swamp and beats Florida twenty six to sixteen. Florida actually looked like the better team, I would argue, for a good chunk of this game. And then they made a few mistakes, and Kentucky kind of – they're sort of that team on thri- that thrives on other teams making the mistake and them and them just being solid. Like, that's sort of the way I view Kentucky in a lot of ways. And that, that worked out for them in this game. They were the more mature, mistake-free team, and that eventually worked out. Um, Anthony Richardson was – looked pretty good, but he also made some mistakes, had, had a big interception, had a big fumble. Um, Anything major to take away from this game? Uh, I wouldn't say that Anthony Richardson even looked pretty good. Um, okay, <laughs> like this, this, yeah, it was he was just bad. This, this was my favorite game of the week. I love <laughs> Kentucky, Florida. I am here for all of it. Um, I mean, I had that in like in my games to watch from last week. Yep. Kentucky, Florida was number one. Um, I, I enjoy everything about this game. I think it's, yeah, it's. Kentucky, you want to talk about rat poison? I think they were sitting there. Kentucky was sitting there just getting – I mean, they, they were pretty much told that Florida was going to roll over them because Florida had beaten a really physical Utah team the, the week before and was going to roll over Kentucky again. And we saw, like, Kentucky was the better football team. Like, they th- – this, was not, this yep. wasn't fluky. This wasn't an accident. Kentucky completely shut down Anthony Richardson, who's tremendously talented, mm-hmm. but they – almost rendered him ineffective two interceptions no touchdowns for richardson one was a pick six one of his picks um went back for a touchdown yes they completely stifled them um especially in the second half there were there were zero answers um for for florida it leaves florida really kind of searching here doing a little bit of soul searching going forward um Mm -hmm. but yeah hats off to kentucky i think levis was okay he was good enough did what needed to be done and he made a couple of really big throws, and the defense picked him up from there on. I thought it was really yeah. a complete performance from Kentucky. Yeah, if you're looking for a few positives for Florida, I did think that most of the mistakes Richardson made seemed like they were correctable mistakes. Um, he doesn't look completely comfortable just as a quarterback yet, and I think that some of the mistakes he made, it was, you know, maybe take a little bit off of this throw, maybe read this a little bit better. But it wasn't like – it wasn't a lack of talent or – ineptitude or anything like that. I, I think that eventually he will be a very good quarterback. He needs some more experience, I think. So just Florida, like long term, I think they have a good quarterback, but they're not they're not in a place yet where they're going to win all of these toss up games. Well, I I, I wouldn't necessarily blame it on Richardson, just him. I think a lot sure. of it was on play play calling for me. That's what kind of popped out that like Richardson, he's he's a dual threat. Like mm-hmm. you shouldn't be asking him to, he, he threw the ball 35 times in this game. He shouldn't be throwing the ball that much against this defense. There mm-hmm. should be more. He should have, he only had six 
does six rushes for four yards. He needs to have at least 12, maybe 15 against this defense. There was no, there wasn't really any lateral motion, not much zone reads, very few, um, yeah, quick screens to to receivers like ETN. Um, Travis's uh, mm-hmm. brother, Travis's brother Trevor, Trevor yeah, yeah. was a freshman. had a had a really good game. Um, yeah. had a touchdown in this game, and he looked like a weapon. Like you need to be getting that guy out in space, just like his brother used to do for Clemson. Um, yeah, screens. There was not enough screens. I not enough swing passes. I I I would blame a lot of that on offensive play calling. I think the the ineptitude there he was asked to, to try to drop back and and just throw an absolute missile over the middle time after time after time hmm. and yeah that's not really his game not yet he has the talent for it there's no doubt but yeah there, there needed to be um a couple of more easy plays like he didn't have enough easy instinctual plays um where you get him out on the edge rollouts play actions um and and let Richardson be the athlete he was the best athlete on the field and he normally is when he plays and he wasn't he was forced to be in the pocket too much and part of that's Kentucky's defensive coaching no doubt but I think a a large part of it is Florida's play calling on offense too yeah that makes sense okay uh one of the big games of the week was supposed to be Tennessee and Pitt I don't know that you have a we have a ton to talk about there um Tennessee did beat Pitt 34 to 27 in overtime Mm -hmm. um seemed like it kind of went about how we thought it would <laughs> is that fair <laughs> yeah no pretty much other than tennessee didn't start hot like True. tennessee normally normally starts just like scalding hot and they like run over everyone in the first quarter they did not do that um in this game at all in fact they trailed um at the end of the first which is mind-boggling like they never trail <laughs> they yeah tennessee tennessee could go with anybody for the first quarter like like going back to last year they mm-hmm. led i think georgia at the end of the first quarter uh, a year ago i think it was Really good to Tennessee to see Tennessee win a game a different way in mm-hmm. overtime. Sure, I'm um, on the road. Um, yeah, big time throws from Hooker. He's a stud. He really is. Uh, Hendon Hooker is an he's he's a ball player. Um, yeah. So yeah, and, the, and he had the game winning touchdown there um, to Cedric Tillman in mm-hmm. in overtime to to win that game. So yeah, cre- we don't want to get into this game too much. Credit to them. Um, Pitt. I, I don't really know other than their running back who really balled out. I don't even can't even really say his name that well. Like he played like really, really well. He had 150 yards and touchdown. They did. There was not really that many positives for Pittsburgh. <laughs> like it didn't feel like they were, they were ranked number 17 at the time of the game. They did not feel like they were the 17th best team in the nation. I would say that they lost Keaton Slovis pretty early to injury. And, and I was impressed by the way they still hung around after that. I do think that maybe Slovis is not insanely good. Like maybe that there's not a huge drop off there from him to the backup. Um, okay. I don't know. So read into that what you will, but we'll learn more about Pitt going forward. Yeah. With, with both these teams, really. Both teams, we'll learn yeah. more. Yeah. Both of these teams, their, their, their biggest games are ahead of them still. So yep. yeah, Tennessee, this is just warm ups for Tennessee and for Pitt. Mm-hmm. There's several other games here we should touch on a little bit. So speaking of high profile teams with bad offenses, Iowa is upset by Iowa State. Finally, Matt Campbell gets his win in El Asico, ten to seven. Just a <laughs> stunningly perfect Iowa Iowa State game. I don't know that we even have to talk about it for more than twenty seconds, but isn't isn't that just about how you expected this to go? <laughs> what what did you call what did you call the game? So, a lot of people refer to it as El Asico. Oh, okay. Like the El, El Clasico is Real versus uh, it's Real Madrid versus Barcelona, and this is okay. Yeah, I got the terrific offenses. Hey, they actually scored a real touchdown. And as someone who was betting on this game and had had Iowa State winning, this was one of my locks of the week, right? I had Iowa State yeah. covering at least. It was very concerning. Yeah. Iowa blocked a punt, yeah. and in the most Iowa way possible, they immediately have a touchdown. It's like, are you kidding? Of course, of course, of course. I bet on Iowa. I bet on Iowa, and they will. They will find a way. Just they're gonna make something work. They're gonna conjure up a touchdown. Like you don't don't even know how they did it, but somehow they got a touchdown early on, and I was scared. But mm-hmm. yes, thank the Lord, Iowa State coming through. Matt Campbell finally gets a win. At Kinnick, by the way, he he doesn't mm-hmm. do it at home. He goes on the road to a harsh environment, wins on the road at Iowa. Um, we can just say that Iowa's offense 
Iowa State's Iowa State's offense isn't good, but Iowa's offense is worse. Like, so bad. Iowa's offense is really not good. Oh. At all. It, it it's painful to watch. I they they might honestly lose. I, I, I don't want to speculate on their record right now. I'm just saying they have not played well in offense yet, and they haven't even come close. So if you have a pulse on offense, you could beat Iowa. They, just saying. Yeah, they, they, had, they had 11 first downs. It was a Texas A&M stat line, really. They had 11 first downs, um, three for 11 on third down, and they had 150 yards total. Iowa State more than doubled them um, in total yards. So, mm-hmm. yeah, Iowa State absolutely pummels Iowa 10-7. to 7. We can say that. Yep. So the other favorite in the uh, Big Ten West is Wisconsin, and they got upset by Washington State on Saturday, 17 to 14. I was not able to watch hardly any of this game. Did you get get any eyes on this? Any thoughts on this? Almost none. Yeah, I'm with you. Almost zero. Um, Like we were expecting Graham Mertz to win. He his stat line wasn't bad. I will say he Mm -hmm. like threw for 227, two touchdowns, only one pick like 14 points against Washington state. Like, yeah, again, I had other games going on at this time was not able to, this was not my, my game of choice um, by any stretch of the imagination, yeah. but like was Wisconsin and Iowa both going down and these are non-conference losses, which helps a lot. Sure. But like, those are the, those are the two, the two teams that you thought would win in the West in the big 10. And I think your preseason pick was Minnesota, yeah. which I'll just say looking a little bit better right yeah. now. Um, that looks better by the week. So yeah, that's about all we really, or about all I have on this game at least. Yeah. I don't have much either. I, Minnesota beat Western Illinois 62 to 10, whatever it's Western Illinois. But I will say if they, if they have an offense capable of putting up 62 points, they're going to beat Wisconsin and Iowa because I feel like they both kind of struggle with the same thing. It's just, that's yeah. just putting up points. <laughs> yes. um, it's the same team. Yeah, basically. Um, let's see. What else should we mention just quick? Uh, did you get any eyes on Arkansas, South Carolina, 44 to 30 win there for Arkansas? I did. I watched quite a bit of that. I think takeaway there is Arkansas runs the ball exceptionally well, almost 300 yards and five touchdowns rushing 300 Mm -hmm. yards rushing and five touchdowns against an sec front. That's hard to do. I don't care if it's against Vanderbilt in the sec, that is difficult to do against an sec team in conference play. Um, yeah. Arkansas's offense confirmed to be really, really good. It's we we talk about it all the time. We love their offense. Me and you both do. KJ mm-hmm. Jefferson, he's efficient. He really is. 18 yeah. to 21. That's efficient. Takes care of the ball, no picks. And you've got some running backs. They're they're running the ball at you from all angles. You don't know how they're going to be running the ball at you next. Um, their receivers are pretty good. Their transfers in. Hazelwood, Jaden Hazelwood, Matt Landers, um, both two guys that transfer in, playmakers at receiver. So Interesting. This is going to be a really fun team going forward. Arkansas can play with anybody in the SEC West, Alabama included. Yes. Uh, so we were huge on the BYU Baylor matchup. Um, it was it was a late late night game. BYU wins in overtime, twenty six to twenty. Um, in a lot of ways, lived up to the hype. Just as far as kind of a slugfest between two teams, two really good teams. Um, were you able to watch any of this? You're on the East Coast, so I imagine it was a little bit difficult for you. <laughs> yeah, I I caught um, a bit of it. I did not watch through the end, I will admit. By the yeah. time it gets into fourth quarter and the overtimes, it was like, I'm just done. The amount of missed kicks um, oh, man. Was, was staggering. Just an incredible amount of, of missed, not, not even difficult kicks, like kind of halfway chip shots. Um, we kind of saw that yesterday in the NFL as well. Like just yeah. like kicks that were just simple that were missed. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, BYU, like it's all ahead of BYU going forward. This is a revenge game, by the way, for them. They got they were able to come back and beat Baylor, mm-hmm. and I know they they put a lot of pride into that. They go to Eugene this week and play Oregon, a game that we'll talk about more in just a little bit. BYU is like they're sneaky. BYU is physical up front, man. They will they will really yeah. try to run the ball, but they have a good quarterback. Like Jaron Hall is throwing the ball really well right now. So yeah, going to be really fun going forward. You get to see them also play Notre Dame um, this year as well. Like they have some, some really good games coming up. going to be interesting. Yep. Uh, USC 41, Stanford 28, USC, their first five possessions in the first half were all touchdowns faded a little bit in the second half um, offensive wise, but 
it felt like they just kind of put it in cruise control. Um, is this your Pac-12 favorite at this point? I think it has to be. I mean, <laughs> I'm not the SEC guy. And in fact, in some of our SEC, or, or sorry, I'm not the USC guy. Um, in some of our preseason videos, I was like, there were some comments that like Ashton's hatred of the Trojans is just dripping. You can just feel it. And like, I do, I do want to say, this was one of my locks of the week. USC was supposed to cover. They did cover. Mm -hmm. I mean, somehow, like they tried to give that away so badly there at the end. That was scary, <laughs> but they were able, they were able to, they have an offense. Like they can beat Oregon. They can beat Utah. Utah didn't look great against Florida. They, they can beat teams with this offense. They do. They do give up points. It's it, kind of what we talked about. It's everything that we talked about. They were going to give up points. They're going to give up a lot of rushing yards. They're like, there's going to be some teams that are going to be able to come in and ball control them to death and just yep. not let Caleb Williams get on the field. But there is no doubt that Jordan Addison and Caleb Williams, that combination is dynamite. Like it is every single week. It's going to be really tough to stop if you get in a track meet with the Trojans this year. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Michigan 56, Hawaii 10. And then we hear the, the news now that J.J. McCarthy has won that starting job going forward. Yeah. Fair to say this worked out about exactly how the Michigan – um, staff was hoping it would. <laughs> I, yeah, very fair to say. I mean, <laughs> McCarthy was the guy. He was always gonna, gonna going to be the guy. I think they just wanted him to prove it. Um, McCarthy finishes the day 11 of 12, 229 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. I mean, almost a perfect day at the office um, from yeah. a quarterback standpoint. This was this was absolutely what the coaches wanted to happen and what the fan base wanted to happen. Um, yeah, feel sorry for McNamara a bit. That's a little unfortunate, but the ceiling's definitely higher with McCarthy. And Michigan looks good. I don't know if you've I don't know if you've noticed in the first couple of games, they haven't played anyone, but they have really looked good. Yep. Um there's hey, there's other teams that are playing no ones and struggle with them. I mean, just ask Texas AM. So um didn't mean to call App State a no one. That's not really fair. App State's much better than Hawaii, but you at least you took care of business. That's what yeah. you have to do. You have to show up and take care of business. Michigan has done that. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of schools that can't say the same. Mm -hmm. Just a fun little what if for you, not fun for me so much, but uh, several years ago, Tommy Reese did choose Tyler Buckner over J.J. McCarthy in that recruiting class. So, did he really? Yes, he did. Yeah. Who was, 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 was Buckner a five-star? I thought he was only a he, four. He was a five-star for a while, and then he missed his entire, I'm trying to think. Uh, he missed his sophomore year due to injury. And then his junior year, he had ridiculous numbers, better numbers than McCarthy by far. And then he didn't have a senior year in high school because of COVID. California moved their season to the spring, and he was an early enrollee. So, gotcha. Yeah. Um, gotcha. Also, he there was video. There's been videos circulating of Buckner as throwing the ball in high school, and he just looked a lot more natural. And then he's he he changed. <laughs> He changed his throwing motion before he ever got to Notre Dame, like tweaked it, whatever. And it, I don't know, he hasn't been the same since. So mm. I don't know if that was one of those infamous quarterback coaches that just as often seem to ruin high school quarterbacks as help them out. I don't know. But yeah. Yeah. Um, we should talk a little bit just uh, Georgia Southern 45, Nebraska 42. Clay Helton beats Scott Frost, and Scott Frost has now been fired. Um, if they'd have waited until October 1st, they would have saved like $7 million or something. But that's apparently how bad this is. They finally – they just said, enough is enough. The Scott Frost era is over at Nebraska. Just looking back on it a little bit, like, are you shocked – are you as shocked as I am that this was just as horrible – like, this went so badly compared to, like, what yeah. we thought it would be? Yeah. I don't know how I'm shocked. I, th I think the Nebraska program is not where the Nebraska boosters think that it is. I think in their mind, they're kind of what Georgia was before Kirby Smart showed up. Like they're just primed and they just need one guy to get them over the hump. They're, they're quite, there are a number of steps below that. Like Nebraska's a little ways out. They haven't been recruiting well. Um, that's I mean that's not a surprise they had a whole bunch of transfers in this year right trying this was mm -hmm. Frost trying to save his job and everything else to fire him I, I don't understand the timing of the firing there, he's three games into this year if you were this close to it you should have fired him last year like they were three and nine last year and I know it was close and they're the best three and nine team in the history of 
college football. We all heard that. <laughs> but like, if you were this close, you're three games into this year. This is a wasted year. Like, like, well, here's yeah. what I don't understand. You're three games into a year. Are you just gonna have an, just going to have someone take over for the rest of the year? Are you going to try to go yep. ahead and hire someone now? Like, you like that that guy's not going to leave his team to come coach your team in the middle of a year, probably. Like, I. I, do, I don't understand the timing, I guess. I understand that firing Scott Frost, I'm not surprised by that. I have, like, why not at least wait a couple of more weeks and save yourself millions of dollars that you can pay and get a better coach, like get a higher paid coach or spend it on coaching, like like assistant coaches? Like, we know that that's gold. Just ask how Arkansas did it, you know? Like, yeah. that works out really well when you go get some good assistants. It's just dumb. It's just dumb, I think. I don't I don't understand the the timing of it at all. I wonder if maybe they had like kind of a backroom deal with with Frost, like say, hey, we're going to fire you on October 1st when your buyout drops. You want to just waive that um, now and, and we'll just be out, be on your way <laughs> so you don't have to coach the next three weeks or whatever. I don't know. That's just yeah. I, I th- rampant speculation on my part. <laughs> I thought maybe like they were scared that he might win a couple of games. And then not be able to fire him. Like that was my (laughs) thought. Like he might, dang, he might come out and win like the next two. And then like, then what do we do? Cause like the feelings are better, you know? Yeah. They didn't really want him to upset anyone. What that's what they really didn't need was him to like pick off like Iowa or someone like that. We got Oklahoma this (laughs) week. (laughs) True. True. (laughs) Yeah. Fair enough. Um, So just kind of reading some of the other scores Friday night, Louisville beat UCF 20 to 14. Saturday, Wake Forest beat Vanderbilt 45 to 25. Kansas State beat Mizzou 40 to 12. Oof. Oof. Yeah. Uh, Texas Tech beat Houston 33 to 30. Kansas beats West Virginia 55 to 42 in overtime. Oof. Oklahoma State beat Arizona State 34 to 17. Virginia Tech beat Boston College 27 to 10 in kind of a sad bowl. <laughs> um, yeah. Oregon State beat Fresno State 35 to 32. They were actually the underdog there, I believe. Last or, play of the game on that one. Yeah. 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 Mississippi State beat Arizona 39 to 17. And that was those, a game that that game ended at like 3 a, 3 a.m. my time. It was incredible. Yeah. It so was I, I saw not even a play of that game. The, some of the right. things that yeah I. Wake Forest being able to pop back as soon as Sam Hartman comes back Mm -hmm. and be instantly like Vanderbilt's actually a fairly good team this year. And you beat him by 20 points. I thought that was actually impressive. I thought that was a really good bounce back. Happy to see him back playing good feels there. Um, Other than that, I mean, not a whole, not a whole lot else. Your Oregon state darling pick for this year, Oregon state, one of your darlings. Hey, big win, big win. Fresno state's a good, a good program. And you beat them on the last play of the game. Huge win. That probably sets them up to go over this year. Like props yeah. to you for, for being all over that. Yeah. I uh, felt good about that. Also felt good about Kansas State. Um, Adrian Martinez puts up 40 points in an SEC team. <laughs> I didn't see, didn't see it coming. Did not see that one coming. And, and how could I have seen that one coming? That one made no sense to me um, just at all. M- Missouri, by the way, is really bad. Yeah, like Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt is probably better than Missouri. Like I'm going to go ahead and say that they now. They got a chance. Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt could absolutely beat Missouri this year. Just I'm just going to go ahead and call that. There you go. Okay. Um, just to recap a few, just real quick, I'll recap our locks from last week. You had Notre Dame minus 25. You had. Uh, I'm sorry. I Notre Dame was minus 20. Yeah. Notre, okay. Notre Dame minus 20 and a half. I think. Yeah, um, I had I had USC covering nine, which they which they did. Um, I I was able to hit on the Iowa State Iowa State getting three and a half. Yeah, uh, they were Iowa plus three and a half. Yep. So, so USC and Iowa State were your wins. Your losses were Notre Dame and then Oklahoma minus thirty three and a half, which was close. Was a, it was just as yeah. a bummer. Yeah. My locks last week. So my wins. You, I also had USC minus nine. I had. Oklahoma State minus 11 and Oregon State minus one. So I had three wins. I also had three losses out at Alabama minus 20, Notre Dame minus 20 and a half. And I had Miami minus 25 and a half. Um, they let Southern Miss hang around a little bit too long. They almost beat them by that much, but not quite. And then my, I had one push, and that was North Carolina minus seven. Gotcha. So what are, 500 what are our for both of us. Okay, so that, what are our records for the year? That would put you at six and two. Okay. And I am now eight, seven, and one. Oh wow! Okay, gotcha. Not so if you're bad. if you're betting if you're betting with us, you're making money. How about you're that? You right. can say that. Yeah, that's yeah. right. 